I'm sure our uh, friends in the audience uh, have uh, are equally intrigued and have several interesting observations and questions. Uh, I can assure you that our team is certainly your your talk has certainly infused an element of uh, curiosity to carry forward our research on China. So, ladies and gentlemen, I open the floor for discussion and questions. Please raise your hands and please do introduce yourself before the question. So, so. Uh, thank you, Professor Sambo. Uh, for me, it's my first time uh, to hear your talk. Uh, although I know you long time ago in China before I come in here. And uh, I know you have uh, written uh, about 20 books about China, but I never read one of them. Uh, before coming to this uh, uh, hall, I read this book. Uh, I had a plan to book one uh, online. Just now I hear your uh, briefing about this book. Uh, uh, I would like to share some of my uh, experiments uh, about uh, what you have talked about. Firstly, that uh, I found that uh, you list you have listed more challenges and uh, difficulties than some op opportunities or advantages uh, about China uh, during your talk just now. It gave me an uh, impression that uh, China is going to towards some uh, uh, negative direction. Uh, because you just listed more challenges than opportunities. That's my first uh, impression. Secondly, I feel that uh, although you are Western famous uh, scholars on China, but uh, to be honest, uh, I'm uh, only over 40 years, uh, by listening to your talk, I found that you still need to have more stay in China uh, than in United States or some other places. Because sometimes I feel that uh, you just uh, not know enough about China. And uh, even some uh, uh, views uh, uh, is full of some kind of Western kind of uh, Bears, uh, although you are a scholar, but uh, to be honest, uh, you, for example, you listed uh, some challenges about you know uh, China's territory pr problem around its own, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang. As we all know, that all those problems, you know, was caused by some Western countries, not by our China own. Some chi uh, Western countries have do it, has done it on purpose to cause unstable problem in China. We know it very well. You know, after 1989, many Western scholars predicted that uh, China is, were going to collapse you know, almost three decades ago, they predict, predicted China's future. But none of them have been proved to be right. And on the contrary, none of the Western country, Western scholars had predicted the financial crisis eight years ago in Western countries. Why? Because Scholars just, you know, use some uh, figures or some uh, models to predict, predict uh, some country's future. But it's too complicated, to be honest, to predict this path. So we can share some views, thank you, for some uh, alerts. We will absorb it uh, absolutely, thank you, all the years, uh, over the past three decades. That's why we Chinese people like you so much. But to be uh, with India, friends, I think uh, it's uh, your advantage to compare with uh, India and China more and share more
common uh, opportunities we India, every China and India share together, and uh, give some more positive aspect than negative aspects. It's more objective and balanced. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anything to respond to there. So, next question, please. Thank you for your, thank you for your comments. Ma'am, please. Uh, Amir. Now, um, thank you for that very informative lecture. Now, but is it anything um, unusual actually what is happening in, uh, is it anything unusual what is happening in China and the United States and you know what will happen in Europe? In the sense that, um, have they stopped learning, uh, have they stopped reading Marx um, both in um, the United States and, uh, and China? At the end of the day, Capitalism, um, as it moves from one stage to another stage, it has to destroy the pre-existing mode of production. And so, it must help to deal with um, the, the, the forms of, um, you know, changes that has happened. Mm. You know, if we were to move to higher level, it must help to deal with the political system, it must to deal, deal with the inequality, it has to deal with a whole lot of things actually. That's what some results are trying to do, you know. He is caught with a situation which, you know, the capitalism has created, mm -hmm. creating a whole lot of people who are out of work, and which is the case in China too, creating a whole lot of people who are rich, and uh, though it dealt with poverty, but, you know, the kind of inequality that it has created, it is, it is bound to create that kind of problem. You know, I just came back from Vancouver. I was, I was in the fall semester. Vancouver's property price have skyrocketed fundamentally because the Chinese are buying the houses everywhere. Right. So they have in, they have introduced a new tax, you know, to uh, for anybody who is buying house if they don't live there, you know, they have to pay heavy um, heavy tax actually. So broadly, what is happening is that capitalism has its own destructive capability. Mm -hmm. And it must help to create these kind of uh, problems. So China would remain, I think, if it were to remain um, anywhere it is to, it has to remain within that, um, you know, new authoritarianism or soft, you know, hard authoritarianism. Otherwise, it is going to create a whole lot of problems, I think, because um, the Leninist societies don't survive. Leninist system did not survive fundamentally because uh, they did not look at what are the consequences of um, the, the, the developmental path pathways they have taken. Mm -hmm. And so the Chinese will have to go through the kind of problems they are going through. The Americans will go through the kind of problems they go through. And India is not far behind actually. India is not far, far behind because there is a fundamental problem with the economic model. Um, is there a question in there? I, there are lots, some interesting observations, but I don't really hear. Well, I don't think there's a question here. You know, if there is any, uh, yeah. any contradiction between. <coughs> I'm Dr. Hafiza. I will answer the question. Professor, thank you for your talk. My question is about your uh, 2012 <coughs> publication, Tangled Titans. I'm sorry, I'm going to need your to. 2012 publication, The Tangled Titans. U.S. and the Ch and China. Tangled Titans. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, since then, do you think? Uh, uh, do you observe any change? Uh, uh, any changes in their uh, relationship as such? And uh, w uh, do you think that, as you have you have already mentioned that it is tangled uh, relations, tangled titans. Right. So whether uh, Trump would be Trump administration would be able to uh, exert any control? on China successfully? <clears throat> well, the, uh, the book, as you say, was published in 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the relationship between the US and China has continued in the way that that book basically described. If anything, it's gotten worse, more strained uh, since then uh, till the present time. 
the U.S.-China relationship is a mix, always a mixture of cooperation and competition. If you remember in that book, I coined the term coopetition. So I have intellectual property rights over uh, coopetition. I haven't filed a patent for it yet. But um, so recognizing that there are elements of interdependence and cooperation between the United States and China, including, for example, climate change accord, that was a very significant achievement. Um, of many countries, not just the United States and China, but uh, it was a major achievement of, of um, President Obama and Xi Jinping's. So there are elements of cooperation that the U.S. enjoys with China and vice versa, but that sphere has shrunk progressively over the last decade or so. And meanwhile, the competitive sphere, the strategic competition, the uh, you might say even diplomatic competition in Asia, the ideological competition, which I think you just heard an example of. <laughs> um, thank you, by the way, for making many of my points very effectively. Uh, that has increased. And so the Trump administration inherits an already strained relationship with, with China. Um, even if Hillary Clinton had won the American election, um, that would be the case, and even if Hillary Clinton had won the election, you could have expected a much uh, tougher American approach to China. Um, so there's a consensus in the United States now that the relationship uh, is not uh, what it should be, it's not as cooperative as it should be, there are problems on both sides, but that there are a lot of problems that the Chinese bring to the relationship, and there's a consensus on the American side that there should um, be some greater reciprocity and uh, perhaps toughness. Now, Trump um, has a particularly tough view of China. Uh, he's really at the extreme. And we're going to have to wait and see what he does. But if, based on what he has said, if he follows through on that, we're going to see a far more confrontational American policy towards China. Uh, so that is going to have uh, negative effects on the relationship. It's going to cause China, I think, to do two things. Uh, uh, China to react, number one. China's not just going to sit passively and allow Trump to attack it uh, verbally or with tariffs, or if he really thinks that the one China principle can be renegotiated, uh, he's got another thing coming. So the Chinese are going to retaliate against American actions and they can cause a lot of pain for the United States. That's the first thing, they're gonna, they're gonna push back. If pushed, the Chinese are gonna push back. Um, and secondly, that a US-China confrontation will have collateral effects on all countries in Asia, including India, all countries. And really, no country in Asia wants a US-China confrontation, I don't think. There are voices in some countries who would like to see a more confrontational American policy, including here in India, and including at the Observer Research Foundation in Delhi, I heard the other day. Uh, they were very positive that the United States should be tough on China. Uh, you go to Japan, you hear those voices. You go to some countries in Southeast Asia, you hear those voices. But I don't think that's the predominant view of, in Asia. Um, most people I talk with want a a stable, cooperative U.S.-China relationship. Um, they don't want a dysfunctional or confrontational one. But so that's what's going to happen. This is this region of the world. You know, get ready. Um, there's going to be a lot of volatility because of the Trump-China policy. Uh, I think we need to anticipate that. And um, depending on how he does it if he's as crude in his China policy as he is in his anti-immigration policy and some of his other policies, um, that's going to produce a, a lot of pushback. So we'll have to wait and see. But I think the, you know, the U.S.-China relationship is the most important relationship in Asia, and it's not going well uh, from our perspective. And I think if you ask the Chinese side, they would say the same thing. Hello, sir. I'm Stephen Fernandez. This question is from our part of the world. How long will uh, China play the you know, Pakistan card against India to get some geopolitical supremacy what they are playing at the moment? 
you know, I've been coming to India since 1974, and I've been hearing that question uh, ever since. Um, I would suggest to our Indian friends that they uh, don't view uh, Pakistan as a client state of China. And, you know, China doesn't use Pakistan as a card against India. I just don't see it that way at all. That's, um, China has a relationship with Pakistan of long standing, um, and one wonders really what China gets out of that relationship. I know what Pakistan gets out of the relationship, but I'm not sure what the Chinese get out of the relationship. Yeah. Uh, I don't study it that carefully, to be honest with you. Um, but Xi Jinping's, you know, visit and the promise of forty-six billion dollars and the economic corridor, all that. We'll have to wait and see, frankly, whether that materializes. Um, I don't think we should assume it will materialize just because it's been promised. Uh, no, the relationship is far more, if I were you, I'd be paying more attention to China's position in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. <laughs> That's where China's increasing its footprint. Mm -hmm. This is Amir. Uh, I'm an uh, associate fellow with Observations Foundation. Okay. Um, I had a question. Like, how will China balance, or how will it rather manage its unstable economy? You were just mentioning that even their heads of states have been saying that it's unstable. Against its investment, say, in something like a CPEC or uh, OBOR. Like, uh, how, how do they balance it? Like, what is exactly the plan? Like, how, how, how will they manage it is the first question. Okay. And second is vis a vis. Uh, if they are rising, if they are taking huge step in global governance, how mm. would they even balance that with these challenges? Like, what would, how, how will it uh, pan out? Um, well, I don't really see the relationship between those uh, economic and domestic challenges and their role in global governance. You know, they've got a lot of money, uh, which is part of how they can contribute to global governance, and they are increasingly doing so. They're paying. Uh, you know, much more, as I said, and they're taking action. So I, I don't really see their global governance activities as being constricted by the domestic situation. I think it's a good, as I said, it's a very positive trend. Uh, we should applaud it. We should encourage it. Um, we should work with China. Other countries should work with China wherever possible on global governance multilateral initiatives. And we should welcome the sec world's second leading power uh, to, you know, contribute proportionately to what they can do. So that's all very good news. So I don't really see the domestic, the volatility that I see domestically, I don't think is going to constrain the global governance side. So your first question, I'm not sure I entirely understand, but how are they going, what's the relationship between OBOR? And the unstable economy that China has. Well, well, the, Answer is uh, over capacity, exporting over capacity. That's one um, driver of OBOR. Another driver of OBOR is the, are the state owned enterprises, which have been told by the central government to go out, zo chu chu is the term, um, and invest abroad. Uh, so that's um, state directed investment. Uh, so that's not going to be affected by the internal economic situations. It's state money, essentially. It's not the private sector. Um, and um, OBOR is, we have to recognize that it's a very good uh, initiative on the one hand. You know, it's not a negative development necessarily. The world, this part of the world needs infrastructure. And that's primarily what OBOR is. $46 billion for the Sorry, forty billion dollars for the Maritime Silk Road Fund, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, another fifty billion of capitalization. Uh, you know, you don't hear the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank complaining about OBOR. No, they're very supportive of it. I'm supportive of it. Great, um, but I think we have to recognize that it's as much a geo-strategic move as it is an economic. Uh, initiative for China, and particularly in this, uh, in South Asia and across to East Africa. So there are, there will be, um, you know, strategic advantages for China. 
as this unfolds, but I think this is a long-term project and we really should not prejudge its success or, or failure. I don't think it's going to fail, but it's not going to succeed 100%. There's a lot of volatility, volatile regions. You know, take the Pakistan corridor, right? It runs right down through Balochistan, um, not exactly the most stable part of Pakistan. So, um, you know, that's going to go forward. Um, I'm, I'm more impressed, actually, by the northern route across Central Asia. Um, there's more progress being made there, to my knowledge, than there is in the maritime uh, southern route. We can have one last question, uh, last Professor. Question. Two questions. So we have three hands. Let's take the last three. That's, that's okay. A young lady in the back and gentleman. No, you, you can go ahead. Uh, in a, <laughs> and Dinesh Rana, uh, you said that uh, China right now in the position of a neo neo author neo authoritarian state. No, I didn't. Not neo authoritarianism. Hard authoritarian. Hard, okay. Hard authoritarian <laughs> state. So it cannot progress from the middle income group to a develop uh, develop uh, type of stature. He can uh, she it cannot develop. It cannot uh, acquire that thing uh, unless until it becomes a little bit more liberal. So the for that, you know, there should be a openness uh, for the innovations and the economic reform. The openness should be required. That is your point. Right. So if uh, we in India, as and when we reach that state of uh, middle income group, will, uh, for us, it will, will it be easy for us to uh, to uh, you know jump to the developed uh, state because we have an innovation type of thing openness and uh, reforms as and when uh, time passes we do it absolutely I would agree with that I don't know if uh, India is in the middle income uh, level yet though according no, to the World no, Bank no. not right no, no. long way away from it but 20% of China they just about $2,000 per capita oh. PPP, right. Oh, yeah, PPP, yeah. Right. right. But when India gets to that stage, India is going to have far better chances of, of getting through it um, for reasons of openness and political system, uh, media. So I think India's intrinsic advantages far outweigh China's at that level of development. Young lady in the back. Uh, yeah. Good evening, sir. I'm Priyanka Kutahi. I'm studying history at Rehan College right now. Okay. And uh, we are studying China a lot. And I actually wanted to ask about the political uh, instability, insecurity right now in China that is uh, occurring, which is being which is being seen in its repression. And what are the factors that are leading to leading to this insecurity? And more importantly, how are these factors so important? Because when we talk about China's leaders, and you also mentioned how uh, Xi Jinping is so powerful right now. And from my understanding, any leader in China, they are so strong that they can enforce almost any policy if they have that strength of mind to do so. So how does this insecurity even matter if they have a leader with a vision sitting there in the office? So, and other thing which I had running in my mind, uh, you mentioned a lot of economic challenges that China is going through. And we had a lecture which was around whether China is becoming internally hollow right now. So what do you have to say about that? I have to say I understood about 10% of your question. I'm sorry. Maybe because you were holding the microphone too close. Um, Could somebody help me? Can I repeat? Understand your question. Do I repeat? Very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are the factors for political insecurity in China? Factors right for what? Political, political insecurity. Political instability in China. Okay. And how are these important? Factors for political uh, instability are social inequality, um, rising social inequality um, between urban and rural. The floating population of the migrant po population, 130 million people, uh, repressed intellectuals, frustrated students and young people your age, not happy, many of them, uh, educated ones at least. Um, 
ethnic unrest, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, are sources of instability. Um, environment, the deteriorating environment, and people quite rightly protesting against that. Um, uh, lack of a rule of law um, or an arbitrary enforcement of the law, shall we say. So those, those elements come to mind when I think of instability in China. And monopoly of political power by a single party, which doesn't share it with anybody. That's a source of instability, in my view. Uh -huh. uh, Professor David, thank you so much for your sharing. It's been such a joy. And uh, for me, it's more special because I first went to China in 1980 mm. on my ship. Yeah. And I was a cadet, and we went to uh, Sinkang, Tainxin, and Beijing. Mm -hmm. And the translator was from a bourgeois family, and one thing led to the other. So we've been in touch with China right up to now because my friends, partners, and associates do a very big business with China and crude oil and refined mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. I follow China through, and you're an expert. And uh, well, things look wobbly in this 10 uh, trillion dollar economy. In all these variables and factors, no one would have dreamt the financial crisis to happen in America. But right. there were two prophets, Rajan, uh, ex Reserve Bank of India, uh, chairman and Rubini, who said and predicted, it's coming, it's coming. Mm -hmm. The same thing is being said of China. Of all these factors, can you put some more light? As you have the credit default swaps, China's a bit opaque. Do you think the real estate development market empty cities will be a big contributor to economic and financial stress and maybe even breakdown of the Chinese economy? Well, I don't, that's an excellent question, first of all. Um, I don't foresee a complete breakdown of the Chinese economy or even a partial breakdown of the Chinese economy. Um, but uh, the volatility we saw in the stock markets two summers ago um, could well be repeated. The debt levels that I discussed, that's really the number one issue, and particularly at the local level. And there was a bullet point I put up there about legitimacy of local governments. If you look at public opinion surveys of Chinese citizens, local governments score extremely low. And the central government scores extremely high. People have uh, real respect for the central government, but they have no respect for local governments. Why? Because local governments are seized land, uh, rent-seeking, um, corrupt entities, uh, and they're despised <laughs> in many areas of China. So that's, um, that's a, that debt bubble is going to burst, and where it's going to burst is not in Beijing. It's going to burst across the country, county after county after county. And that will have a snow, snowball uh, effect. Um, and I'm not sure how the central government, the central government will ha has the liquidity to step in and stem the hemorrhaging when that starts. I don't, and economists, I'm not an economist, but the economists I talk to have no doubt it's going to start because they see no way to recall the debt or write off the debt. So that's coming. Housing bubble is an interesting question. I'm not, um, well, it's related because a lot of these ghost cities are built with that money, which is debt-fueled, right? So you're quite right that there's a, a, um, a, a relationship there. Um, the uh, property prices are very inflated in a number of cities. It's not the first time. It's actually the third time in the last six years. They've been through two cycles that the, the government, again, subsidies. This is what the Chinese government knows how to do, fiscal stimulus. You get in problem, you pump money into the system. Well, that's what they did in the, after the global financial crisis in 2009. $664 billion pumped into the system. They are now paying. Why do they have the debt levels they have today? In large part because of that initial stimulus package. So they're still paying the price of their reaction to, to the global financial crisis, which they weathered. You know, I was living in China that, for that year. Um, 
and I you know, watched, watched the global financial crisis unfold, and, and the Chinese did very well. The government, the central government did. So there's a lot of, you know, these rocks under the water of the Chinese economy. Yes, there are a lot of strengths. I, that's why I had a whole slide of things that are going right, private sector growth in particular. Um, but, you know, it's going, it's left to be seen how they're going to deal with these rocks under the, under the water. Um, the ship may, if you're, you're in the shipping industry, you, you understand the metaphor, right? The, the ship of state may hit one of these rocks here before, before long.